Good evening, everyone. My name is Julia Mead, and I am a graduate student in Eastern European history here at the University of Chicago. And I am excited to welcome everyone to tonight's Series of Voices event, uh, sponsored by the Center for East European uh, and Russian Eurasian Studies. Series of Voices is an author-centered series of conversations on books about Central and Eastern Europe, Russia, Central Asia, and the Caucasus. Um, our long-term partner for this series is the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, uh, where you can order the book we will be discussing tonight. And you can find a link for that in the chat. Uh, also, if you're interested in catching up on previous events in the series, you can look at the Center's YouTube channel, uh, which is also in the chat. Tonight, we are excited to welcome Emily Grebel to discuss her new book, Muslims and the Making of Modern Europe. Professor Grebel is Professor of History and Russian and East European Studies at Vanderbilt University. Her research focuses on Islam in Europe, the transition from empire to nation state, civil conflict, and legal encounters in the Ottoman European borderlands. Uh, she'll be joined in conversation this evening by Tara Zara. Professor Zara is the Homer J. Livingston Professor of East European History in the college here at the University of Chicago, and she's also the um, Roman Family Director of the Neubauer Collegium. Her research focuses on the transnational history of modern Europe, and she is most recently the author of Against the World, Anti-Globalism and Mass Politics Between the World Wars, which I think will be available in about two weeks. Um, and we will be collecting questions for the question and answer period of the event um, in the Q&A box. So feel free to write them in there throughout the discussion. Um, I will now th hand the things over to Tara to begin the conversation. Okay, um, hello everyone. Um, for those of you who are new to this uh, series, um, I just wanted to also announce that we'll be giving away um, books, I think 10 copies to the first 10 people to um, respond in the chat box uh, with their name and email address. So um, take advantage of that opportunity. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'm really excited to be here talking about this incredibly important book for the field of uh, European history. Um, and we're going to start off as usual with a short presentation uh, by the author, uh, because, you know, we're assuming that not everybody has had the chance yet to read the book, although I hope you all will. Um, that'll be followed by a kind of conversation um, between myself uh, and uh, Emily, and uh, then we'll try to leave at least 15 minutes for questions. Um, we uh, would uh, prefer that you put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, unfortunately, with this format, that, that's kind of what's going to work most easily. And then um, I will read the questions and Emily will answer them. Um, thank you all so much for your patience with this format. I'm glad everybody is up for at least one more um, Zoom conversation, Zoom event. This is, uh, this is really, I think, a special one. And um, I, with that, I just will welcome um, Emily to speak about her book. Thank you so much, Tara. And thank you, everybody out there, for, for coming on the Thursday evening. Um, I look forward to hearing questions and thoughts. And I'm really, I've been excited about this conversation since we first started talking about having it a year ago. And I'm glad we were able to uh, be here today. So I hopefully the share screen will work. Let's see. Uh, yep, it works. Great. So I always like to start off with an anecdote or story. Um, and the one I'm going to start off with you today is one that opens uh, the first chapter of my book. So in 1882, a Muslim man by the name of Abdullah, who was a business owner from Podgorica, got into a fight with Montenegrin authorities about his citizenship. And here are some historic photos of Podgorica. Abdullah was one of about a million Ottoman Muslims who found himself suddenly living in a new state after the Congress of Berlin. Is everything okay? Esther, I see multiple Esthers, so I'm not sure if something's going on, but I'm gonna keep going. 
Everything's okay as far as I can tell. Okay, great. <laughs> so Abdullah found himself suddenly living in a new state. International diplomats had decided to redraw the political boundaries of Ottoman Europe after a series of wars and uprisings and foreign interventions. And they decided to reallocate land from the Ottoman Empire to other Christian-led European states. So Abdullah hadn't moved, the border had, and he didn't like it. Now, lots of people were in a similar boat, Muslims, Christians, and Jews across Southeastern Europe. This is the map from uh, of Ottoman Europe, Ottoman circa 1850. Europe. You can see the Ottoman Empire controlled sweeping territories in Europe, right? And this political map is gonna change. In 1878, you can see where Podgorica is now in the state of Montenegro. And then it's gonna change again in 1912 and 1913 during after the Balkan Wars with more Ottoman land shifting to other European states. It's gonna change again in 1918, 1923, 1941, 1945, you get it. So in earlier wars before 1878 and earlier border changes, um, Muslims had been anchored in law and the international imagination to the Ottoman state. So what that meant was when political boundaries changed, Muslims tended to be expelled or deported, or if they stayed as small communities did in places like Serbia and Greece, they generally assumed a foreign status with limited rights. But in 1878, as Abdullah was adapting or not adapting to his new life in Montenegro, the terms of political belonging were changing. Enlightenment concepts of liberalism and liberty were affecting the way that diplomats were thinking about states, about citizenship, and also about Muslims. So the great powers pressured new governments that were acquiring Ottoman lands to give citizenship to all men in their territories, regardless of their religion. Eager for territory, sovereignty, and also international legitimacy, states like Serbia and Montenegro agree. Austria-Hungary also consented to similar provisions in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which it occupied in 1878. So for the first time on paper, Ottoman Muslim men living outside the Ottoman Empire supposedly had the exact same rights as Christian men. The rights to vote, to hold office, rights of liberty and religious freedom, the rights to keep one's property or be fairly compensated. And I like to call these Europe's first Muslim citizens. We can talk about whether the concept of citizen works here. Um, but there's a catch, right? These Muslims have to accept the terms of citizenship in the new polity and also show loyalty to their new state by meeting the obligations of citizenship. So what do they have to do? They have to pay taxes. They have to serve in the army. They have to learn new languages. They have to send their kids to school. The acceptance of the system is critical for it to work at all. So only those Muslims who agree to the new political boundaries can count on the rights and protections of citizenship. So at home in Podgorica, Abdullah finds it ludicrous that he's required to fight for an infidel army if he wants to stay in his home. He appears to have considered himself to continue to be an Ottoman subject, though the source doesn't stipulate that, um, even if the international community did not. He refuses to pay the uh, taxes to Montenegro, he refuses to join the army, and so he is thrown in jail. And he's not alone. He's got a bunch of Muslim cellmates also in Montenegro jails. Um, he also is part of a larger community of Muslims who had no interest in being part of these new states, even when they're invited back after wars. Many Muslims had been expelled or targeted through mass violence, burned villages, massacres, hardly a sign of welcome. So even though they're being told they can return, they don't necessarily want to. Other Muslims rebel. They hold up in mountains and forests and form militias to fight these arriving governments and armies that were claiming their lands and homes. They perceived these new states as illegitimate and hostile. Now, from great power perspectives, these were insurgents, they were rebels, they were disrupting international order and European peace. But from Muslim perspectives, it was not clear why foreign powers had the right to determine who ruled them, where the borders were drawn, or what kinds of laws were going to dictate their lives, their property rights, and the ways they raised their children. 
tens of thousands of Muslims across Southeastern Europe would choose insurgency over citizenship in the 1880s, the 1910s, the 1920s, and again in the 1940s. But jail, flight, and migration were not the only options. Among Abdullah's neighbors, there were also many who chose to work with their new governments to figure out a solution for them and their families within this transforming European order, to take control of the situation, to define citizenship on their own terms, to shape property regimes, educational structures, ideas of religious freedom and liberty, social and cultural organizations, and to sort of try to make a place for their own cultures histories and legal norms in the countries where they lived and had lived for many centuries. So this is really the starting point of my book. Um, Muslims in the Making of Modern Europe is a collective history of several generations of Muslim men, women, and children that seeks to understand what did European nation building, legal development, and state building look like when told from the perspective of Europe's Muslims? I trace the region's history from the 1870s to the 1940s to try to grapple with how Muslims understood nation building, religious freedom, and also the generational traumas associated with series of dispossession, marginalization, and loss. Now, the Muslims, oh, I lost my map. Where'd my map go? All right, well, I'll get to that. The Muslims at the center of the book um, are overwhelmingly local Muslim communities. That is, they came from families who had lived in the Balkans for centuries, at least. The terms that often get used for this are autochnitis, indigenous, native, each of which has sort of problematic theoretical um, <clears throat> uh, implications. They include men, Muslim uh, men, women, and children, merchants, peasants, and landowners, muftis, and imams, teachers, and students, believers, non believers, literate, illiterate. These Muslims spoke many different languages, um, Albanian, Bosnian, uh, Serbian, Tatar, Turkish, Croatian, Romani. They also spoke many regional dialects. Uh, many also read, wrote, or spoke in Arabic, Persian, German, and French. People often spoke and read and wrote in multiple languages, which is pretty customary um, in imperial and post-imperial spaces. These were predominantly Sunni Muslims who adhered to the Hanafi legal school of Islam, and also other Muslims who practiced a range of Sufi traditions and syncretic approaches that reflected the region's Ottoman heritage. They lived in all sorts of different places. Um, here are a number of uh, coastal towns and seaport places like Ultin and Bar on the shores of the Adriatic. They came from urban centers like Sarajevo and Skopje and Tetovo and Kosovo Mist, uh, Mitrivaca and Novi Pazar. They also came from mountainous communities um, in what is today North Macedonia, Kosovo, Montenegro, Bosnia, Serbia. Um, Sort of in the broadest demographic terms, this is a little map that gives you a sense of where these communities were. It's imperfect as so many demographic maps are, uh, but these are all places where Muslims constituted at least 15% of the population and in many places um, up to 90%. So at any given point in my narrative, um, the borders are sort of changing, but I'm talking about generally one to two million people. So, how did I put this story together? Uh, I like to joke lots and lots of archival research in different parts of the Balkans over many, many years with small children and a dog. Uh, more seriously, I relied heavily on municipal and state archives from multiple countries, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Serbia. Um, I looked especially at ministries of law, education, the interior. I also looked at records from madrasas, Sharia courts, and Islamic pious endowments. Uh, <clears throat> I looked at the personal papers of members of the Muslim elite. I looked at unpublished travelogues, journals, transcripts from conferences in which Muslims participated. And throughout the book, I really try to draw upon Muslim voices, sources, and perspectives to try to think about some of the vague narratives of European history. So I know that Tara is probably going to ask about a bunch of them, and the book tries to make a lot of different arguments in different time periods, but three that I just wanted to leave you with before we turn it to Q&A are those. The first is um, Muslims are European, right? and they are part of the Euro 
fear and experience, and they shaped European constructs of citizenship, law, liberty, and more. I think this is one of the arguments that's been resonating a lot with people, because on the one hand, it seems so obvious, and yet on the other hand, uh, we don't have a lot of the empirical research that is making that case, um, although there have been recently some wonderful studies um, and two excellent books on Greece have come out in the last two years um, by a, a fellow colleague of yours in Chicago, uh, Stefanos Katsikos. Um, so the place of Muslims in Europe today is commonly predicated on this fantasy that Islam was not part of European states from the outset. Muslims are regularly depicted as migrants, refugees, colonial subjects, or foreigners, rather than communities that are part of the Europe, of European history and part of nation building. And this is simply not true. Uh, Muslims were part of multiple states, Austria-Hungary, Yugoslavia, but also states in Central and Western Europe. They helped to write constitutions and laws. They fought in armies. They shaped school curriculum. They negotiated and defined property laws and agrarian reform. They pushed back questions of modern tax and pushed back on questions of modern taxation. Um, and yet, very few of us know of these stories. The field of European history has sort of collectively erased a lot of them um, and has contributed. Um, in negative ways to the idea that Muslims are not of Europe. Um, and I argue throughout the book that the silences around Muslims in European history are about the ways we have collectively written Muslims out. So the silences are not in the history itself, but in the history writing. Another argument that I make, and this is a little bit more something that I think historians, especially Ottomanists and historians of 19th and early 20th century Europe, um, have found resonant, and, and I've enjoyed those conversations about it, is that Muslims were conceptualized in modern European political thought and European consciousness as a legal minority. They were not simply understood as a confessional group, like Protestants or Jehovah's Witnesses might be understood, and they also were not understood or treated like other national or linguistic minority groups, like Germans in Poland or Italians in Yugoslavia. They operated on a category of their own, and they were understood as a community with distinct legal structures, legal norms, and legal rights. And this has implications. Debates over Islam and Muslims' rights and positions always privileged legal questions and tended to concern the place of Sharia law and Islamic institutions in these societies. Now, this empowered Muslims to utilize law and legal institutions in thinking about their relationships with states and national groups and also with each other. We see this, for example, in ways that Muslims in Yugoslavia drew upon the international concept of minority rights and protections to fight for and win a constitutional provision for a Sharia judiciary in that state. It also has another consequence in that the way the system is set up Islamic legal scholars and practitioners of Islam are designed as the intermediaries with new European states and political authorities. So the people charged with translating nation building policies for the Muslim masses tended to be Islamic legal scholars um, and not other kinds of members of the Muslim elite like landowners or merchants or writers. So this would mean by the 20th century that many discussions about Muslim rights, but also Muslim political organization emerged within legal communities or had some form of a legal angle. Um, and I suggest in the book that it's hardly surprising that political Islam in Europe emerges through these debates and discussions concerning Islamic legal revivalism in the 1930s. So finally, a third kind of bigger argument that I make um, is that the way we understand and speak about ideas of European liberalism and European secularism today are deeply problematic. They're grounded in a notion that Islam is fundamentally foreign to Europe and that secularism has operated in a particular way throughout European history. When we analyze Muslim Europeans' experience over two centuries, and across many different states, when we look at the Habsburg Empire, Yugoslavia, Greece, Serbia, we come to realize that Europeans who are arguing that Islam is incompatible with the modern secular world really only have one vision of secularism, one where restrooms can be segregated by sex, but swimming pools should not be, where hashish should be banned, but alcohol should not be, 
or blue laws banning factory work on Sundays are secular, but closures for Ramadan or a Friday prayer service are somehow incursion, the incursion of Islam into European public life. And so what I try to show in the book um, through sort of examples of the ways these things have been negotiated and debated in previous moments um, is this was not always the way that secularism or liberalism or liberty were understood by Europeans. And our understanding today of what is Europe and what is the secular um, is not religion neutral and not grounded in the region's own history. So ultimately, I hope that by connecting sort of deep archival research from this one corner of Europe to larger questions of European history, that my book offers a method and approach um, to draw on Muslim histories in Europe to rethink the way that we're understanding Europe itself. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, that was really great. And also, um, it was a, 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 I mean, a wonderful overview of some of the contributions the book makes. Um, and also, I think a great starting point for our discussion. I can't help but comment on one of your slides, perhaps the most surprising of all of them, which was the one that um, where we saw cherries, coffee, and juice in an archive. <laughs> Um, it looked like a great place to work. Uh, yeah, so that that's really fantastic. I mean, the research for this book is is truly impressive linguistically um, in terms of its reach, in terms of the range of sources um, and the time span that you cover. It's, it's just a, such a great accomplishment. Um, I wanted to start off our conversation with the title of the book. I think to some extent, you've already answered this question, but to take it a little further, uh, you know, you didn't choose um, to call the book Muslims and the Making of the Modern Balkans, or um, you you chose um, to put Europe in the title. And, you know, as you explained, part of the reasoning for that um, is that you are making a, an argument about um, the ways in which Muslims <laughs> are European. Um, I, but I wanted to talk about the making part, uh, because I think there's some ways in which you also show how the debates, the events, um, the, uh, the, the um, institutions that you trace in this book were also foundational to um, creating to developing and changing ideas about what Europe itself is or what Europeanness or civil European civilization is. Um, and uh, I'd just be interested to hear you say a bit more about that aspect of the book. Absolutely. Well, as you know, titles are a tricky thing because we, we usually throw one out or we throw five out and then it becomes a conversation with editors and marketing teams and all sorts of of people. And so when I when I first was talking about this title, it had the book had many iterations of, of earlier titles, one of which was uh, Citizens After Empire. That wasn't quite right. Um, uh, it, another title was about Muslims in the Balkans. Um, but in the conversations with um, with the editor, uh, we started to sort of dig out and tease out some of the sort of challenges with to making this just about or, or titling it something that would sort of narrowly attract a certain readership who was excited about the Balkans already. Um, and one of the things that, you know, Balkanists, and when I present about the book in Serbia or Bosnia, we talk about this, we're like, well, of course we're Europe, right? Of course this is Europe. There's no question that, you know, the Ottoman Empire is Europe, that Austria-Hungary in the Balkans is Europe. But I think that among sort of the Anglo historiography, the Balkans continues to get sort of sidelined and marginalized from these conversations. And, um, you know, recently with the Ukrainian war, it was really telling that people kept talking about how this was the first war in Europe since World War II. And, you know, that was really kind of upsetting to people um, who, you know, live in Southeastern Europe and, and who study it. And, you know, because of course it's not the first war since World War II. So that's sort of, I think, part of what we were trying to do with the with the title itself was to tease out this and sort of challenge our own presumptions about where we think of what is Europe. 
In terms of the making part, um, this I think was the most sort of fun part of the writing and of the argument itself was to discover and find all of these cases where um, local or sort of national Muslim leaders were actively shaping policy um, and thinking about, you know, what does that mean for subsequent policy? And there's a number of other scholars who have been kind of looking at this. There's a wonderful historian, Yelena Radovanovich, who works on sort of Ottoman and post-Ottoman niche, for example, right, and looks at just property law and the ways that this Ottoman property law is becoming absorbed and integrated into post-Ottoman states. But not just that, it's also being absorbed and integrated into, for example, Austria-Hungary and the way that they're analyzing and thinking about this. And those legacies then are going to affect other parts of Europe. And I think there's a lot of ways we can, you know, carry that forward in the future. Um, but thinking about how Muslims were defining nation building projects, school curriculum, pushing back against things that new states were coming in and saying were you know, secular or um, you know, religion neutral and saying, no, this isn't, right? This is not secular religion neutral. You're actually you know, actively trying to convert my child through your social studies classes. So let's think about what that would look like if you wanted it to be secular or religion neutral. And can we adapt it. Um, there was a big argument in 1941 in, in the Belgrade Law School over the legal curriculum because they, you know, how much of the general legal curriculum should include Islamic legal past and should it just be sort of put into an Islamic legal course or should it actually be understood as part of the broader um, legal foundations of the region. So these are just some of the ways that um, I think the making part is is really important. Yeah. Um, that kind of relates our, uh, to another question I wanted to ask, and it's another one that came up in, in, you know, at the end of your presentation when you talked about some of the principal arguments, um, but it seemed incredibly important to me. Um, the contribution your book makes uh, to the history of uh, minority rights um, more broadly is, seems huge. Um, and it seems to me that you were really pointing at some of the contradictions in how that concept was implemented um, in the first place, sort of the tension between saying we're so progressive because we have minority rights, but in fact, like Islam cannot be <laughs> progressive and therefore, um, you know, we need to, uh, we need to somehow eliminate um, um Muslim religiosity. Uh, you also really point out that you kind of make the argument explicitly that um, legal autonomy, Islamic legal autonomy is a kind of double-edged sword with both positive and negative consequences. Um, and I was wondering if you could just say more about that. Uh, for example, how it shapes um, religiosity in the community and, and um, other aspects of um, community life. Yeah, those are great questions. So in terms of minority rights, I think one of the things that Muslims do in Southeastern Europe is they challenge all the categories and they sort of, because they speak multiple languages, they live in different uh, kinds of communities. They identify and associate with different political organizations. They practice Islam in diverse ways. And so this idea that there should be a singular minority in which all people are supposed to kind of fit in is deeply problematic. Um, and it actually sort of forces Muslim leaders to invent a new kind of political minority and create a sort of political agenda that will allow, you know, or, or encompass all of the diversity of Muslim communities in, in the region. And this, this does create some real tensions and problems within the Muslim community. Um, you know, famously in, in the early 1930s, Sunni Muslims go and try to kind of eliminate the Sufi Tekka. It causes this rift between Slavic speaking Muslims and Albanian speaking Muslims over like who gets to define what it means to be a Muslim. Um, and, and so these kinds of conversations are happening within this larger sort of European moment and also moment in the Middle East with the mandates over sort of what minorityness means and who has what kinds of rights and who gets to define them. Um, so that's one of the things I'm trying to look at uh, in the sort of, especially in the interwar period, about the ways that this language sort of 
forces minority communities to make adjustments and adapt and create new kinds of political goals in order to claim that minority status. Islamic legal autonomy is, is a double-edged sword. Um, I have a wonderful case in the book from 1913 of a uh, Muslim girl who gets kidnapped. She's a Serbian citizen. Her parents go to the local police and ask um, them to investigate. Um, and they say, well, we don't know if she was actually kidnapped or if she ran away and is she married? Because if she's married, she then falls under Islamic law. Um, and so here you have this case. Um, and of course, there's no, it's, it's Balkan Wars or maybe 1914. Or, actually, no, it's 1915. So you've actually, you're in the middle of World War I. And here she is, you know, there, there are no courts, right? <laughs> it's, it's wartime. The courts aren't functioning. And so they don't quite know what to do. Nobody's legally responsible for her. And ultimately, the Ministry of Interior writes back and says, you'll just have to defer to community elders because we have no system in place here. And so there's this system on the one hand of sort of winning legal autonomy um, in that case, but on the other, sort of it actually dilutes sort of citizenship protections and, and rights, both for the young woman and also for her family. Um, the other problem, or I mean, I don't know if it's really a problem, but the other sort of curiosity of, um, of legal autonomy is sort of where it goes and what it extends to. And there's a lot of different debates, um, you know, schools, madrasas and maktabs, should those fall under legal autonomy or should those be under sort of civil education? Um, and pious endowments, endowed property, does fall under um, sort of the domain of Sharia. And so, you know, that then is a question of does all property law, um, how does that fit into all of this? And so you end up with a lot of sort of unusual um, cases over mixed marriage, over inheritance, over property disputes, in which Muslims presume that Islamic law is higher in the hierarchy, and they, you know, agreed to the terms of citizenship in exchange for their understanding that their laws will prevail. Um, and in some cases, they do. And the, you know, there's a case in Montenegro and another in Austria-Hungary where they just say, OK, you know, we're going to defer to Islamic law in these, in these examples. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's really interesting. Um, and you know, I'm going to allow myself one more question, at least. I can't help it. But I, I was interested in hearing you talk a bit more to the extent to which this is you see this as an, um, a history of empire. Uh, or whether, I mean, you know, I'm not asking you to make comparisons to other states in, but in some ways it seems like um, there, there are ways in which uh, Muslims are working very much within, both within and against imperial structures um, in this story. Um, yeah, so if you could say a bit more about, you know, the category of empire and, and if or how, or and the context of empire, if or how that seems significant to you, um, even in the interwar period. I mean, Yugoslavia is itself a kind little of, empire, a little <laughs> empire, right? So, yeah. I mean, I think that the category of empire is useful in sort of a um, def in sort of definitional terms, right? We we understand it as differentiated rights and you know, local negotiations with the center. Um, <clears throat> legal pluralism, these kinds of ideas, the kind of literature and empire was really helpful. Um, and, you know, in that regard, there's been some great work done on, you know, is Yugoslavia, does it continue to be and operate like an empire? And, you know, it conti does continue to, you know, to be structured along many of the similar lines um, as either the Ottoman Empire or Austria-Hungary in terms of differentiated rights for different groups. Um, and also sort of these distinct regional um, relationships toward, toward the center. Um, but I, I've struggled a little bit with the idea that, um, that, that we should distinguish between empires and nation states, because I think what we're seeing in, uh, in, in Southeastern Europe is a real fluidity. And there's characteristics that we might presume belong to a nationalizing state that actually you can see backward in the 1860s and 70s, you can read them into the past. And there's aspects of that we might associate with um, imperial structures that still exist in 1945. 
And, and so what I've, I've really started playing with is that um, these are all just different kinds of states and they are larger states and smaller states, um, but that you know the categories of empire and nation or nationalizing state themselves I think in this period, you know, from the 1870s through you know, the 1940s, they don't really do much for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you know, a, there's a lot more similarity across both polities, right? So if you look at Austria-Hungary in you know 1900, and you look at Serbia, they're both in conversation with each other, and also there's a lot more similarity in how they are sort of structured than. Um, than sort of this tremendous difference that we might presume by giving them different kinds of titles. Would you say, though, I, I totally agree, I, but I also wonder, were those categories useful to people at the time themselves in sort of making claims for or against uh, a particular policy or, or cause? Yeah, I think that the category of empire, especially for Muslims in Austria-Hungary, um, could be useful because it implied a certain form of negotiation was possible, especially mm -hmm. around the idea of autonomy, which was a very distinct um, Ottoman legal and political category. Uh, Amy Janelle is coming out with a, a great book about this, hopefully at the end of this year, and sort of the ways that this legal category took on new lives in post-Ottoman spaces. Um, and so that was really inspiring to me as I was working through this, because I think a lot of what you see in Austria-Hungary and also then in Yugoslavia, which kind of absorbs um, those territories, is this sense of this is how the Ottoman system worked. And now that we're still part of an empire, that system can continue to work for us. And um, you even see cases where you know, Bosnian Muslims write to Montenegrin and Serbian and Greek and Bulgarian Muslims and say, like, just go along with it because then you'll be able to negotiate. Yeah. <laughs> right. But that wasn't always necessarily the case in the smaller states that were kind of really Im implementing these more rigorous nationalizing projects and more violent projects. Yeah. Thanks. Um, we do have a fair number of questions already, so I think we're going to turn to some of those. Um, and I don't know how many we'll get through, but please keep them coming. Um, uh, we'll go as long as we can, um, finishing hopefully around at seven o'clock. Um, one of the questions I thought that that's come up that seems um, pr particularly interesting um, is uh, about the specific kinds of policy changes that Muslims pushed for? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the specific policy changes involved schools right? and course curriculum. A lot of states sort of came in with these civil uh, ideas of what civil education would look like. And, and those civil education was deeply grounded in typically in Christian ethics, but also in a sort of narrative of the past that was, um, you know, marginalized Muslims, discriminated, was often uh, very negative, uh, in part because many of these states were sort of forming themselves and sort of their own national mythology and their foundational myths and their legitimacy was based on the idea that they were liberating themselves from the Ottoman Empire. And then there was this association that Muslims are Ottoman. And so um, you ended up with some really demeaning narratives and they would complain about them and argue against them. And people would either hold their kids back and they'd say, we're not sending them to your school unless you change it. Um, or there were cases where they would negotiate you know, with political authorities to try and change the narrative. Now, sometimes they're more or less successful. There's there's moments where you know they are able to, um, <clears throat> you know, remove really derogatory um, descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad, for example. Um, but then in other cases, they they struggle with. Um, there's you know, in Montenegro, for example, there was this one moment where they're given their children are then given the choice that they can go to religion class with the nation or they can remove themselves from the nation during that you know, hour of school, uh, which of course implies that the nation is Christian. And, and there was a lot of that built into it. So those are some of the ways that they you know, push back in education. Another place that they really push back in is in terms of how property would be um, sort of reconstituted and what kinds of legal property rights they would have. Uh, and 
get pious endowments, who gets to control it, how does it work, um, <clears throat> who has custody of children if, if you mm -hmm. do have a mixed marriage and, you know, the Catholic wants, you know, they, they split up and the Catholic church says, well, the child will go with the Catholic mother, but the Islamic courts would say, no, it belongs to the father and they would win. Um, so there were some cases like that. Um, and those are kind of some general sort of local policy issues. I mean, as I mentioned, the biggest sort of one to me was also at this national level where they use the language of minority rights to fight for the enshrinement of a Sharia judiciary in the constitution and, and they win and that exists until 1946 um, where all Muslims are required in Yugoslavia to uh, take socio-religious legal matters to the Sharia courts. Yeah, I have a, that's really interesting. I have a kind of follow-up question there, which is, I think one of the things you do really well in the book, and you kind of illustrated it even in your presentation, is point to the diversity of different kinds of Muslim communities. What kinds of conflicts emerge among or between Muslims in the, you know, period that you're studying or over the course of time? I mean, so many. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, in the 1920s and 30s, no, I mean, across the globe, right? There's different ideas of what the, the best political future should be. And there are Muslim communities who are really inspired by, you know, Kamala's Turkey and the secular project that's going on. And you have widespread reformism and sort of this idea that, you know, in order to be active citizens of European states, we need to sort of modernize and reform institutions, structures, practices of Islam. And then you also have people who say, no, like, why does that have to be the way we become, you know, or we're sort of engaging with the new political order um, and throw themselves into more Islamic schooling um, and also sort of very much a modern political movement um, in that, you know, wanting to increase and expand literacy and develop political movements and, and and find political posts in order to make statements, you know, against certain sort of more liberalizing or secularizing trends. And so what we find then in the 1930s um, is just like we see anywhere else in Europe, right, these divisions. And one of the things I, I try to point out is, you know, we have these movements that often get sort of sidelined as you know, somehow political Islam is not European, but, you know, it's it's actually the, the movement itself in the 1930s is not that different from what it's what's being called for in other sort of radical right or conservative or different movements. And they're sort of seeking a moment to try to make sense of how do we counter um, this, you know, secularizing, liberalizing order and and how do we you know, claim power within it? And that then leads to all sorts of alliances and negotiations, especially in World War II. Yeah, thanks. Um, we have some other questions. Uh, one, uh, one attendee would like to know more about what language is used in your mm -hmm. research. So my main research language is uh, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, Montenegrin. I work with both the Latin and Cyrillic scripts. Um, this, that was the biggest sort of language challenge for me of the book because when I started moving, I was trained as a 20th centuryist, and as I moved deeper into the 19th century, uh, handwritten Cyrillic is is hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, I also work with German and French. I don't work with uh, Turkish or Albanian. I've relied heavily and very you know, upfront about that. I've relied heavily on those uh, literatures um, and tried to integrate, you know, a variety of other kinds of sources to capture, um, to capture those voices and perspectives, um, as well as, you know, other historiography. But I, I look forward to sort of seeing where the, you know, where the field goes, because uh, I do think there's, especially on the Albanian, um, on the Albanian side, a lot, um, to, to do, a lot of work to do, and I, I'm eager to see where it goes. Yeah, thanks. Um, another question that has come up, um, if Muslims were conceptualized as a legal minority in Europe, does this mean that the powerful legacy of the Ottoman Empire was erased in East Central Europe at some point? I think actually the opposite, because I think that in the Ottoman Empire, you know, minorities started to, I mean, and, there's been a lot of literature about this in Ottoman history um, and, and sort of changes to the way we think about it. But um, 
confessional groups often had sort of a legal underpinning and that changes over time. Um, but there were sort of elements of sort of a confessional minority and a legal minority as, as going hand in hand. Um, and I think that what we start to see is kind of a shift where that system is, is being absorbed and expanded. Um, and, it's, and this goes back actually to a question you asked earlier too, Tara, about other empires. And I think we see that, that legal construct, not just in Southeastern Europe, but obviously also in the French empire and in the British empire, we also see it in the Russian empire. Um, and I think that that sort of is, you know, the ways that Muslims are understood and kind of conceptualized and also the institutions created um, around Muslims are very much a legal one in a way that they're not for other minority groups. I was thinking actually a lot also when, when reading your book about indirect rule in the British empire and kind of the way in which that codifies a group as a, you know, and, um, you know, on the one hand is a tool for providing autonomy, but on the other hand, kind of, you know, obviously particular people define what the, you know, so-called native customs are, uh, and uh, that privileges some voices within the community over, over others. So, yeah, I, in some ways it's very, I mean, I think the European nature of these kinds of structures, um, is really, uh, really clear if you think comparatively. Um, yeah. And I hope, I hope more people will do that. You know, that's part of what I think your book will enable. Um, so uh, let's see other questions that have come up. Um, I know you have a, a you'll have a, a, an opinionated answer to this. Uh, in some ways, you've already addressed <laughs> it. In thinking of Europe, do people and some historians, especially in earlier times, tend to discount Eastern Europe and focus on Western Europe as the true Europe? Absolutely. One of my favorite uh, reviews that I got about this book basically made, I mean, if I, that's a little tongue in cheek, but basically makes the argument that this book isn't about Europe. There's nothing in it about Germany. Right. And, you know, how we are understanding or defining Europe, especially when we start with the question of Muslims in Europe or the field of Islam in Europe, right, is so grounded in Germany, France, and even Britain often gets cited on, you know, there's actually like a really robust literature on Islam in Britain um, that it, you know, carries us through from the colonial period to the present and local communities and global communities. Uh, so I, Eastern Europe um, absolutely gets marginalized, and even within Eastern Europe, the Balkans often gets sort of cut out. Um, if you if you read books on Eastern Europe, you know they often don't include the Ottoman Empire, or they'll have like a little section on you know the Ottoman Empire as a backstory to the real East European states of Serbia and Montenegro and Bulgaria and Romania. Um, and so, you know, I think part of the the, the political project um, or the historiographical project is really bringing the Ottoman Empire into East European studies and also bringing Eastern Europe, you know, and, and really thinking about Europe as a cohesive whole. But even within, you know, at, at ACES, right, there's hardly ever anything on the Ottoman Empire. Yeah, it's true. It's starting to change a little, uh, yeah. but I just was on Twitter, somebody asked if the ACES grants included Turkish and the answer was no, they don't, right? which is kind of fascinating if you think about you know, the Caucasus and Southeastern Europe, right, are they, and Central Asia, and that, you know, certain you know, time periods, Turkish would absolutely be, you know, a main research language. Yeah, I mean, there was a time also where ACES and MESA actually were held on the same weekend, so. That like my kind entire of, graduate school life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that made it tough. Um, so uh, we have a question from um, Stefanos Katsikas, who oh. you called out in your talk. Um, and he asks, how did the emergence of Albanian nationalism and the establishment of Kemalism in Turkey influence the policy dynamics within the Muslim communities of Bosnia, Herzegovina and former Yugoslavia? Yeah, that's a great question and hi. <laughs> uh, so in the 1920s and 30s, you know, we, as I mentioned earlier, we do see this rift between people who are sort of looking at reform like reformist Muslims who are sometimes sort of drawing upon aspects of Kemalism. Um, you also have vibrant secular Muslim communities and intellectuals who are sort of want to distance Islam from sort of Bosnian Muslim or Albanian identity. But you also have resistance to that. 
Um, and you have groups in, you know, for example, Albanian speakers in, in Kosovo and in Sanjak, which is this region in uh, southern Serbia and Montenegro, kind of today it um, uh, transcends those two states, uh, where people did not support um, national movements, they did not support Kamalism, they weren't supporting Turkish nationalism, they weren't supporting Albanian nationalism, and many of them really were sort of seeking a restoration of the Ottoman Empire um, and, and, and grappling with this sense of, of real traumatic loss, um, not just of their own sort of their own position coming out of multiple wars and dispossession and mass violence, but also sort of the, the larger loss um, and of, of this empire that they had connected to. So we have cases of Muslims who leave, um, especially from Southern Serbia and they move to Turkey and then they come home and they're, that's not what we thought we were going, where we thought we were going. Um, there's also cases actually of um, <clears throat> religious Muslims who kind of start uh, underground madrasas in, in Skopje, um, where they're you know, trying to kind of keep alive an older learning tradition um, that had been in Istanbul and then was no longer allowed. Um, and you have also have a, a lot of people who continue to write in Ottoman Turkish, even after it's uh, you know, no longer being used in Turkey um, and the Yugoslav government at, at certain points doesn't really know what to do with that. <laughs> so you stop writing in Ottoman Turkish, but this is the, you know, this was the major written form of language. And, political elites are going to continue to write in it. And, and so you have these kind of unusual tensions then throughout the 1920s and 30s, um, Albania especially becomes um, increasingly sort of solidified as a state. It becomes increasingly a, a, a state that he, uh, the Yugoslav government is very wary about, um, even if you know, there's certainly some Albanian uh, Muslims who are attracted to Albanian nationalism. There's others who are not, but it kind of becomes uh, Sort of the, there's almost like a, a panic across Yugoslavia about what this this state means when a, such a large portion of their population is Albanian Muslim, and that then creates discussions about potentially mass deportations of Albanian speaking Muslims um, in the late 1930s, um, and you know, tensions and conflicts uh, into and through the 40s. Yeah, actually, that kind of um, goes right to a, another question that I'd been. Um holding on to, which is, uh, you know, your first book really looked at intercommunal relations during the Second World War. Um, and I guess I wonder if, if or how the research you did for this book um, either changed or enhanced your understanding of what came after of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. You mean what came in during the Second World War or what came yeah. after the Second World War? Or, I mean, either, but I mean, you know, kind of thinking um, the book really concentrate, you know, kind of mostly ends um, in the 1930s. And so, and you, you're an expert, obviously, on, on World War II. So, yeah, I'm just curious if it like um, gave you a different uh, or, you know, a different understanding or, or just maybe reinforced what you already knew, but um in a different way. I mean, I think that I, I, I became the sort of religious motives behind the ways people um, and, and behind Muslim action in World War II and also in the early communist period became clarified for me in a new way. Um, and, you know, I, I think that, you know, we often have these narratives of you know, especially those of us who study and work in Bosnia Herzegovina, there's sort of these two narratives of World War II, and one is about the Bosnian Muslim Hanjar SS division, which is you know, run by Nazis, <laughs> and you know, support, you know, actively you know, engaged with Hitler and supportive of you know the German um, sort of rhetoric and, and goals. Um, and then on the other side, we have these stories of, of rescue um, and, you know, religious Muslims who are hiding Jews and writing resolutions. There's a book recently by, uh, edited by Matt Kartich, which deals with all of these resolutions, which is one of the only cases in Hitler's era of people sort of denouncing mass violence and genocide and racism, right? So you have, and you have like 16 of them in, you know, in, um, that Muslims are writing and producing across Bosnia-Herzegovina. And so I think one of the things that this book really helped me think about 
and I should say the same thing's happening in you know, Kosovo um, with Albanian Muslims. We have these sort of stories of collaboration and stories of resistance and rescue. Um, and I think what brings them together is it's not that these are all different people. It's that these are people who were sort of motivated by faith. And I think taking Islam seriously as a motive um, is often something really hard, you know, and, it, and David Blackburn wrote about this years ago, right? We, you hear historians of Europe struggle with taking religion seriously, but I think in writing this book and really understanding all of the ways um, that Islam was central allowed me then to see that the choices people were making that we might be putting some kind of framework on um, were sort of consistent with their with their own motives. That's really interesting. Thanks. Um, let's see. Um, another question from Stefanos. To what extent is Sufist Islam rep represented in the new political order? Are Muslim communities mainly led by the ulamas and the so-called mainstream Islam? Mm. Um, so I think that the ulema and the uh, sort of so-called mainstream Islam uh, become the people who initially negotiate with the state. And this kind of fits into that argument about law becoming so central. And this um, has really serious repercussions for Sufism and people who sort of don't buy into the sort of centrist narrative. Now in Yugoslavia in the 20s and 30s, this is complicated by the fact you know, by the linguistic challenges as well, because you have Slavic speaking Muslims who sort of see themselves as higher on a Muslim totem pole than Albanian speaking Muslims, and that often then would get um, paired with certain kinds of sort of Sunni Sufi um, tensions, although most Sufis were also Sunni Muslims. So it's, um, so it, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge, um, but you do see kind of a consolidation. And I think it's, um, it's part of this sort of idea that you know, being a Muslim minority, they want a singular formation of, of what that's going to look like. Thanks. Yeah, I, I probably one last question. There's a question about um, assimilation. And I um, was also wondering, kind of as you were speaking about that really interesting um, you know, sort of divorce cases and so on and so forth. To what degree were um, Muslims in this region marrying Jews and Christians? And um, was it sort of at a, would you say at a kind of, was there change over time? Um, was it, you know, kind of more common in certain area, regions or areas than others? Um, or if there was any trends in that, in kind of um, the degree to which, um, people were um, intermarrying? Yeah, so there is quite a bit of intermarriage. Um, typically, uh, it's, yeah, it's Muslim men with non-Muslim women. That's not just typically, that's sort of universal um, because Muslim women were not allowed to marry outside of the faith. And so you do have, and it, and it does grow in the 20s and 30s. There was a great dissertation about this um, by Fedja Boric, never published yet, but been pushing him to do it um, because he really does document sort of how sort of intermarriage is not only expanding but also how it operates on the ground and you know it's it it becomes kind of a problem for you know to come back to to Stuthis's question right about sort of the ulema it becomes a problem for the ulema because as sort of the law increasingly becomes centralized and more secularized, these mixed faith marriages um, are, are a challenge because women will just, you know, leave or they'll get, you know, they'll, they'll get a divorce or they'll just disappear. And, you know, there's no recourse. The courts don't have the power. There's no like police associated with them. You can't go and require someone to come back to a marriage. And so in 1938, um, the Raisul Lima, the sort of leading figure, administrative religious figure of Muslims in Yugoslavia, um, actually starts to pass regulations prohibiting mm -hmm. intermarriage. And they do that increasingly as you get into 1939, 1940, 1941. Um, it starts out by, you know, creating all these rules, and then it actually even limits convert, like conversion. So, which I've, you know, and con so converts to Islam have to then wait six months um, before they're allowed to marry Muslims. They have to prove they're actually Muslim. And so they try to kind of 
really tighten control over the boundaries of the Muslim community um, in order to sort of protect it from dilution. And that is, I think, a direct response to the growing rates of, of intermarriage that you see, especially in cities, even small towns. I mean, it's, you know, it's modernization and urbanization, industrialization, you know, people going to college and going to school and meeting people in cafes and at the movies. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to kind of maintain these bounded communities. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately, but um, I just want to say thank you again for sharing your um, book with us, for giving us a taste of it. I hope that everybody has been inspired to read it. Um, there may still be the possibility of registering to get a free copy. Um, and um, to say thank you to all of you for showing up tonight, um, for your questions, and um for spending an hour with us. Um, thank you so much. All yeah. Thank you again and, and good night. Bye.